Hello and welcome to Eastern Roman History. The Black Death, a terrifying pandemic of bubonic plague, spread from Asia and affected most of the known world, killing tens of millions of people. It first appeared in Constantinople in 1347, just as the Second Paleologan Civil War, 1341 to 1347, came to an end. John VI Cantacuzanos, the man that won the Civil War, having just come out of the most devastating conflict the Empire had faced in its restored state since 1261, then had to rule what remained of the Empire with his people dying in their hundreds of thousands. It is to his credit as Emperor that he was still able to maintain his country even with all of these disasters occurring, which a lesser ruler might not have succeeded in doing. Nikiforos Gregoras considered him a very good emperor, aside from his heresy. See Gregoras, Book 2, page 589 of his histories. A few months before the pandemic arrived, the dome of the Hagia Sophia collapsed, casting omens among the Constantinopolitans that the apocalypse was coming. For many, it did. Reportedly in the Chronicon Estents, eight-ninths of the population of Constantinople died from the plague, though this is likely an exaggeration. See Nicol, The Last Centuries of Byzantium, 1261-1453, to page 216. Suffice to say, a swathe of the city's population died. Nothing is known about the death tolls in major cities like Thessalonica and Adrianople, nor is there an explanation for why the Ottomans were less affected than the Byzantines, allowing them to take advantage of their reduced demographics. The plague was transported on Genoese ships from the Crimea, probably from the siege of Kaffa in 1346 between the Mongols and Genoese. The plague would occur ten more times in the empire from 1347 to 1453. There are two accounts of the plague in Byzantine histories, one by Nikephoros Gregoras and John VI himself in his history that he wrote once he became a monk. Nikephoros Gregoras, Byzantine Histories, Chapter 16. During that time, a serious and pestilential disease invaded humanity, starting from Scythia and Maeotis, the Sea of Azov, and the mouth of the Tanis, the Don Estuary. Just as spring began, it lasted for that whole year, passing through and destroying, to be exact, only the continental coast, towns as well as country areas, ours and those that are adjacent to ours, up to the Gadara and the columns of Hercules. During the second year, it invaded the Aegean Islands, then it affected the Rhodians, as well as the Cypriots, and those colonising the other islands. The calamity attacked men as well as women, rich and poor, old and young. To put matters simply, it did not spare those of any age or fortune. Several homes were emptied of all their inhabitants in one day, or sometimes in two. No one could help anyone else, not even the neighbours or the family, or blood relations. The calamity did not destroy men only, but many animals living with and domesticated by men. I speak of dogs and horses, and all the species of birds, even the rats that happen to live within the walls of the houses. The prominent signs of this disease, signs indicating early death, were tumorous outgrowths at the root of the thighs and the arms, and simultaneously bleeding ulcerations, which, sometimes the same day, carried the infected rapidly out of this present life, sitting or walking. During that time, Andronikos, the youngest of the king's sons, died. And now the account of the Emperor Cantacuzanos himself to compare. John Cantacuzanos, Histories, Volume 3, Book 4. Upon arrival in Byzantium, she, the Empress, found Andronicus, the youngest born, dead from the invading plague, 
which, starting first from the Hyperborean Scythians, attacked almost all the sea coasts of the world and killed most of their people. For it swept not only through Pontus, Thrace, and Macedonia, but even Greece, Italy, and all the islands, Egypt, Libya, Judea, and Syria, and spread throughout almost the entire world. So incurable was the evil that neither any regularity of life nor any bodily strength best cared for died in the same manner as the poor. No other major disease of any kind presented itself that year. If someone had a previous illness, he always succumbed to this disease, and no physician's art was sufficient. Neither did the disease take the same course in all persons, but the others, unable to resist, died the same day. A few even within the hour, those who could resist for two or three days had a very violent fever at first, the disease in such cases attacking the head. They suffered from speechlessness and insensibility to all happenings and then appeared as if sunken into a deep sleep. Then, if from time to time they came to themselves, they wanted to speak, but the tongue was hard to move, and they uttered inarticulate sounds because of the nerves around the back of the head were dead and they died suddenly. In others, the evil attacked not the head, but the lung, and forthwith there was inflammation inside, which produced very sharp pains in the chest. Sputum, suffused with blood, was brought up in disgusting and stinking breath from within. The throat and tongue, parched from the heat, were black and congested with blood. It made no difference if they drank much or little, sleeplessness and weakness, were established forever. Abscesses formed on the upper and lower arms, in a few also in the maxillae, and in others on other parts of the body. In some they were large and in others small, black blisters appeared. Some people broke out with black spots all over their bodies. In some they were few and very manifest. In others they were obscure and dense. Everyone died the same death from these symptoms. In some people, all the symptoms appeared, in others, more or fewer of them. And in no small number of cases, even one of these was sufficient to provoke death. Those few who were able to escape from among the many who died were no longer possessed by the same evil, but were safe. The disease did not attack twice in order to kill them, Great abscesses were formed on the legs or the arms from which, when cut, a large quantity of foul-smelling pus flowed, and the disease was differentiated as that which discharged much annoying matter. Even many who were seized by all the symptoms unexpectedly recovered. There was no help from anywhere. If someone brought to another a remedy useful to himself, this became poison to the other patient. Some, by treating others, became infected with the disease. It caused great destruction and many homes were deserted by their inhabitants. Domestic animals died together with their masters. Most terrible was the discouragement. Whenever people felt sick, there was no hope left for recovery, but by turning to despair, adding to their prostration and severely aggravating their sickness, they died at once. No words could express the nature of the disease. All that can be pointed out is that it had nothing in common with the everyday evils to which the nature of man is subject, but was something else sent by God to restore chastity. Many of the sick turned to better things in their minds by being chastened, not only those who died, but also those who overcame the disease. They abstained from all vice during that time, and they lived virtuously. Many divided their property among the poor, even before they were attacked by the disease. If he ever felt himself seized, no one was so ruthless as not to show repentance for his faults and to appear before the judgment seat of God with the best chance of salvation, not believing that the soul is incurable or unhealed. Many died in Byzantium then, and the king's son Andronicos was attacked 
and died the third day. As much as John VI is informative, it mimics the description of the plague of Athens that Thucydides wrote about in his History of the Peloponnesian War. This is a literary trope very common in Roman culture called mimesis, where a writer took how something was written previously, such as Thucydides, and just replaced the facts of the matter to their own times. Lyonicas Calconcondyles does this by mimicking the historical style of Herodotus. This was a highly praiseworthy practice, as it showed you were cultured, and those reading it would pick up on this. This has important implications for a history that uses mimesis, however. See Thucydides, Book 2, Part 47 to 55, to see the differences and similarities between the account of John the Sixth on the Black Death and Thucydides on the Plague of Athens. To end this video about the Black Death, I thought I would read a quote from the Chronicle of John Froissart, a French historian of the Hundred Years' War, to give another account of the Black Death as seen from Western European eyes. The Chronicle of John Froissart, Book 1, page 111 to 112. In the year of grace 1349, the penitents went about coming first out of Germany. They were men who did public penance and scourged themselves with whips of hard-knotted leather with little iron spikes. Some made themselves bleed very badly between the shoulders, and some foolish women had their clothes ready to catch the blood and smear it on their eyes, saying that it was miraculous blood. While they were doing penance, they sang very mournful songs about the nativity and the passion of our Lord. The object of this penance was to entreat God to put a stop to the mortality, for in that time of death there was an epidemic of plague. People died suddenly, and at least a third of all the people in the world died then. The penitents of whom I am speaking went in companies from town to town, and from city to city, and wore long felt hoods on their heads each company with its own colour. Their rules forbade them to sleep more than one night in each town, and the length of their goings out was fixed by the thirty-three and a half years which Jesus Christ spent on earth. As the Holy Scriptures tell us, each of their companies went about for thirty-three and a half days, and then they returned to the towns or castles from which they had come. They spent very little money on their journeys, because the good people of the towns which they visited asked them to dinner and supper. They slept only on straw unless illness forced them to do otherwise. When they entered a house in which they were to dine or sup, they kneeled down humbly on the threshold and said three Poitonosters and three Ave Marias, and did the same when they left. Many reconciliations were achieved through the penitents as they went about, for instance over killings which had taken place, and about which it had so far been impossible to reach an accord. But by means of their penitence, peace was made. Their rules contained some quite reasonable and acceptable things, which agreed with such natural human inclinations as to journey about and do penance. But they did not enter the Kingdom of France because Pope Innocent, note, until 1352, it would be his predecessor, Clement VI, who was at Avignon at that time with his cardinals, considered the practice and opposed it very strongly, declaring in condemnation of the penitents that public penance inflicted by oneself was neither right nor lawful. They were excommunicated for doing it, and especially those clergy who went with them. A number of priests, canons and chaplains who supported them were deprived of their benefices. Any who wished for absolution had to go to Avignon to get it. So this movement was broken up and came to nothing when it was seen that the Pope and the King of France were against them and they did not go beyond Hainault. 
If they had gone to Cambrai or St. Quentin, the gates would have been shut to their faces. As soon as the penitents appeared and the news of them spread round, the sect of the Jews contemplated and feared their own destruction. In the original version of this paragraph, it read, At that time the Jews were taken and burnt everywhere throughout the world, and their possessions seized by the rulers under whom they lived, except in Avignon and the domains of the church beneath the protection of the Pope. After this, one manuscript, B6, has the addition, For the church does not hold that they should be put to death, because they would be saved if they were willing to return to our faith. For they had a prophecy made over 200 years earlier, which said in cryptic language, Knights will come bearing lengths of iron, will be very cruel, but they will have no leaders and their power and their works will not extend beyond the empire of Germany. But when they come, we shall all be destroyed. Their prophecy came true, for in those days all the Jews were indeed destroyed, though more in one country than in another. The Pope and the kings of Castile, Aragon and Navarre accepted great numbers of them and laid them under tribute beneath them. I have been your host, Daniel Maynard, and we'll see you next time.